everyone, my name is Murray Fredland and I am the oldest of four kids of Dell and Joanne Fredland. I think that's why I got this interview, is that, that uh, piece. I'm a strategic advisor at Bentley Software and I obtained my PhD from University of Saskatchewan under the supervision of Ward Wilson back in 2000. So Dad has been a university professor for as long as I can remember. I remember as a kid going up to the university and um, being intrigued with the big mainframe computers and having his grad students bugging them until they would show me things about the mainframe, how to program it, and uh, just love the academic environment there. The grad students were good to me and I remember getting into wars of playing Space Invaders and posting high scores with the grad students <laughs> that were there at the time, so it was a lot of fun. Dad did a lot of traveling to conferences as I remember growing up over the years. I was fortunate to go on a few trips with him to Kenya, to Japan. We did a short course there and um, other trips as well, too, that were fun. Um, we got stuck in Egypt once. I remember that. <laughs> I missed a flight out of Egypt. And that was a little bit interesting going home. But that's, a, that's another whole story. Um, so over the years, I've witnessed Dad's unending passion for doing research in unsaturated soil mechanics. He's been very dedicated to that topic and pursuing it rigorously over a number of years. And I've been fortunate to see him, uh, that career play out here. So I have a series of questions that I would like to ask dad. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to go over a little, some of his CV, just his background, and a um, few details of dad here. Dad graduated from University of Saskatchewan with his bachelor's in civil engineering in 1962. He immediately went to University of Alberta, obtained an MSc degree in 1964. He then worked for RM Hardy and Associates uh, for about two years, and then I was hired to teach geotech engineering at University of Saskatchewan. Almost, almost immediately he applied for educational leave, and two years later he returned to University of Alberta and obtained his PhD in 1973. So over the next 34 years, Dr. Fredlin supervised more than 100 graduate students. That's a lot of, a lot of students he put through the university. On both their master's and their PhD programs. His research studies focused on two general areas, mainly behavior of unsaturated soil mechanics and the computer simulation of slope stability and continuum mechanics field problems. So he's published around 500 conference and journal research papers and I can warrant that he has edited a lot of papers as I saw them lying around the house with a markup all over them, including some of my own. Let's just see here. He's undertaken technology exchange programs with several countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. So he took early retirement in 2000 to fulfill a lifelong degree to mentor young, young faculty. And he was invited to under undertake mentoring programs in six countries. So teaching young faculty how to apply the scientific methodology in undertaking research studies. So, Dad, we have a series of questions I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind here. So, could you, the first question, could you tell me something about your childhood and what interests you as a child? Well, thank you, Murray, for your kind introduction. Uh, this is a bit of a reverse roles today, having you ask me the questions. Usually it's the other way around. <laughs> Let me say, make a few comments about my childhood. My grandfather, your great-grandfather, emigrated from Sweden to Canada about 120 years ago. That's just around 1900. And uh, they homesteaded on the prairies of Saskatchewan. Homesteaded means they were allowed to buy 160 acres of land for $10. And that's what my grandfather did. He started to cut down trees, built a log cabin. My mother was born in that log cabin and lived almost all of her 96 years within 100 yards of where she was born. I was born on the same farm within 100 yards of that log cabin. And it was a, a small f farm. And uh, I... Uh, Watch my father modify pieces of machinery. I was always intrigued by how he could improve the machinery by making some modifications. I like to take things apart and try to put them back together. Often I couldn't get them back together. 
Let me tell you about a, a couple of incidents. My father bought a, a 1949 Dodge one-ton truck. And uh, I was about 11 years old. And uh, it was just at the time when turning signals were coming in. And uh, I felt that my father should have bought one, a truck with turning signals instead of one without. So I decided I would try to make turning signals, uh, install them on the truck. I bought a flasher and decided to wire up and I got a, a set of uh, signal lights for the truck. It was a few weeks later that I noticed that the signal lights were removed from the truck and I asked my father, what happened to the signal lights? He said, oh, I was driving to town the other day and uh, all of a sudden smoke started coming out from under the dashboard and I had to rip out all the wires because it shorted out and I was afraid it was going to burn the truck down. Well, I, I, I did things that my father should have scolded me for. I don't remember. He was very tolerant and uh, always uh, helped me do things that, that I wanted to do. When I was 15 years old, I, I decided to make a snow toboggan. This is before skidoos came out. And I got a 10 gallon drum and welded cleats, uh, angle irons on the side of it, took the motor or the engine off the grain auger and built a, uh, a snow toboggan around those two main things. It worked pretty good this, on, as long as I was on hard snow, but when I struck out across the field in the soft snow, soft snow I buried the snow toboggan and had a lot of difficulty in getting it out back on the road again. So it was a partial success. But probably the thing that is of uh, greatest interest to me was the fact that on our farm, we had a little stream running through the pasture, and that stream always intrigued me. I would spend hours and hours, ever since I can first remember, even as a, a five-year-old boy, <clears throat> taking my spade and trying to build a dam across the, this little stream. The dam was only about a foot high, and invariably it was overtopped and it washed out. Uh, there was things I needed to learn about building a dam. By the time I was 15 years old, each year the, the dam got to be higher. By the time I was 15 years old, I, I had built a dam up to three feet in height, and it formed an, a huge reservoir of water behind it. And I, this was my super dam. I was so proud of it. One day, the neighbor came over to our house on the farm, and he and Dad stood out in the yard and talked for a long time. And uh, after the neighbor left, I asked Dad, is there a problem? And my dad said, yes, your dam is a problem. He said, my neighbor's complaining that the cow, his cows are standing in water in the pasture. And... Um, and, and so you have to uh, get rid of your dam. Well, that dam overtopped as well. So there was things I needed to learn about um, building a dam. And so I, I needed to go to high school, needed to go to university and study. Anyways, those are some of my recollections from when I was a, a child on the, growing up on a small farm on the prairies of Saskatchewan. Yeah. And I think I remember my recollection is of you and Grandpa building actually a bridge where you could drive the tractors over that creek. Yes. And you hauled in logs and lashed them together somehow. And then you had a bridge later on. I think that was yeah. after the dam here. But that I, was my recollection. I'm surprised that you remember that. <laughs> yeah, that was quite uh, I'm intriguing for me as growing up. I remember mm -hmm. seeing you and Grandpa work on that. So that's, that's neat. Yeah. And um, question number two here. So how did you choose to go into civil engineering? Well, I grew up in a small town with, with had a small high school. They had no such thing as uh, career counseling. 
I knew very little about what I would do after I graduated out of grade 12. I, uh, during my high school, I worked in the print shop and I learned to run the linotype. And I thought that I would be a printer all my life when I got out of grade 12. I went to Regina, the capital of the province of Saskatchewan, and um, worked for the Regina Leader Post. One day I was walking down the street in Regina, and I met a student that had graduated a year before me. And uh, we went for a Coke, and uh, I asked him what he was doing, and he said, oh, I'm I went to university last year, and I said, what are you studying? He said, I studied engineering. And my response was, what is engineering? And so for the next hour or so, he told me about the classes he took. He told me about descriptive geometry, about the classes in mathematics and physics and chemistry. I was so impressed by this, I thought this would be great to study engineering. So I went home and uh, wrote a letter requesting an application form, and by that fall I was in first year engineering. So that chance meeting on the streets of Regina changed my career, and this was the start of my um, pursuit of an engineering degree. Yeah, sometimes small conversations, hey? Yeah, it changed the direction of my life. Yeah, so how did you end up in your first place of employment is the next question. How long were you there? What were your responsibilities and what did you accomplish there? Oh my. It's a big question. When, when I was um, in, still in undergraduate engineering, I got a job uh, on this building, uh, the, extending the runways on the Saskatoon airport. And so I, as an undergraduate student, would sit out in the hot sun in the summer and dig little holes in this compacted gravel and measure the density. I would dig holes, fill them up with Ottawa sand, calculate the density, and this intrigued me that I could do a simple little test like this and, um, and measure density and then tell the contractor, you got to pack it, compact it more. It made me feel very powerful I could control the contractor by this little test I did. Mm -hmm. And I even tried to figure out, how can I make that test better? But anyways, that was my undergraduate experience. When I graduated out of fourth year engineering, I had two job offers. I had one to work for a government agency, and I would be given $450 a month. I was given a second offer, and it was to work for the National Research Council of Canada, Division of Building Research. They offered me $425. I took the $425 instead of the $450, because I thought it, would very, it was interesting work being done by the National Research Council. And so I went to work for them uh, for the summer, and that changed the direction of my career. They, we, uh, much of the prairies of Saskatchewan are, are, uh, are, are covered by progressial lakes, lake sediments that were deposited at the end of glaciation. Mm -hmm. And in this, the clays have dried out because we live in a semi-arid environment. And so there's a real problem with houses cracking up and the basements cracking up. And there was a dispute that the, the um, people at NRC explained to me over whether the houses are cracking because they are going up out of the ground or whether they're sinking. And the contractors would say, oh, they're sinking. We've got to put broader footings on them. Mm -hmm. And so how, how can we apply a scientific methodology to figure out whether the houses are going up and down, up or down? So we had to install deep benchmarks, and we found that the houses are coming out of the ground after built, being built. Uh, all the houses in, on the prairies and in Canada have basements about seven feet below. So you actually unload the soil. It, it ta uh, takes on water and the swelling. Clays create distress to the, build, to the houses. So that was 
a, a, a direction that it gave me direction for both my master's and later research for uh, subject studying expansive soils. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what was the topic your master's and your PhD thesis? Oh, my topic on my master's thesis was controlled by uh, the work I had done at NRC, uh, I realized that I could just scratch the surface of understanding the behavior of swelling soils. And so my master's thesis involved trying to figure out how best to predict the amount of heave is to, uh, could occur and how much distress could occur to the building. So that was my master's. By the end of my master's, I realized that Really, it, this is um, uh, just a, one of the applications of unsaturated soil mechanics. And I wondered why they hadn't taken a broader scope to this area. And for my PhD, I, I studied and, and attempted to put together the basic building blocks for um, unsaturated soil mechanics where swelling soils was just one application, compacted soils was another, and there was many. I realized that the field is much broader when we looked at it from the standpoint of unsaturated soil mechanics as opposed to just a swelling clay problem. And it, we also looked at the behavior of the buildings in terms of changes in soil suction. And normally, they would look at the problem in terms of change in water content, realize the change in st the stress state became a more powerful tool for handling unsaturated soils problems. Good. As I, as I look back to my childhood, I realize you funded a lot of my sports, hockey and baseball. I realize that's the result of you being gainfully employed by somebody, mm -hmm. which was the University of Saskatchewan. So how did you come to be employed by the University of Saskatchewan? Actually, I was working with a consulting firm, R.M. Harding and Associates, and um, I, I had looked at uh, quite a number of problems related to swelling soils, and uh, I heard about a conference being held in uh, Texas A&M in um, College Station in Texas, and R.M. Harding and Associates sent me to this conference and I could sit for three days and listen to all these people from around the world talk about their findings with respect to swelling soils. And I found that almost every country of the world had a major problem with swelling soils. Um, when I came back to, after the conference, I was asked to give a talk at the geotech, to the geotechnical group in Edmonton and explain to them about the conference. Uh, I gave a talk and tried to summarize what happened at the conference, what I had learned. And somebody listening in the audience wrote to the head of the department in the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon and said they were impressed with my talk and they thought that I should be hired for the new position at the University of uh, Saskatchewan. So uh, I was recommended and given the, the job to teach at geotechnical engineering. My first day at work, uh, I was given a mentor to, to help me um, get established. I went out for lunch with the mentor and he told me, he says, the first thing you should do is um, you should apply for educational leave. I, I said, but I, I just started uh, work this morning. You want me to apply for an education leave? Yeah, he says, 20 years from now, you won't want to be around this place if you don't have a PhD. So I started teaching with a master's. I, after two years, I went back and did my PhD. And that's sort of the, the route that I took to get established at the University of Saskatchewan. Yeah, good stuff. So, and then uh, when you're there, you would have had to pick an area of research to mm -hmm. study and to focus on and uh, just walk us through how you arrived at that. Well, I was advised to choose two areas of research to focus on. And of course, one of them, the first one I gravitated towards was unsaturated soil mechanics, which embraced a whole 
a, a list of types of problems that could all come under the umbrella of unsaturated soils. I, uh, and so one of my areas that I got involved in was on the behavior of unsaturated soils. They, it was also the time when they were building dams in Canada and there was a federal government agency that was in, uh, responsible for the, the design and the building of those dams. And it was a man, they headed up the program by the name of Bob Peterson from PFRA. And he talked to me and said, if I was a young man like you, uh, starting out my career, he was old, I was young. He said, I would pay some attention to this thing they call the digital computer. He said, I think it's going to change the way we solve problems in geotechnical engineering. And so he, he um, encouraged me to look into computer applications. And I did. I found a program written in Unicode by someone in, from Brazil. I converted the Unicode to Fortran and learned my Fortran better. And I s chose the slope stability problem as my application. And so I had to start from square one figure out how you put together the code for a slope stability problem. Yeah. By the time I was done with that, I had 13,000 lines of code. And uh, um, I had a program that now people were wanting uh, and w wanting to get a hold of. And, uh, and so I had to start a, um, well, I should say the program was called Slope 2. Um, and uh, I formed a, a company to market it, mm -hmm. and I found that it was in demand around the world. And so that was the start of a company called um, mm -hmm. Geoslope Programming Limited. Good stuff, yeah. History being made, eh? <laughs> yes. And so what further developments of equipment uh, would you like to see happen? In, in computer software now, what intrigues me is that um, the whole area of... There's been many conferences that have focused on the, un, the behavior of unsaturated soils. We've come to the place where we understand the fundamental theory of unsaturated soil mechanics. Mm -hmm. And uh, estimation procedures based on the, uh, a relationship between degree of saturation and suction become the key to estimating the soil properties for an unsaturated soil. So there, I can foresee that uh, estimation procedures along with artificial intelligence can make the area of unsaturated soil mechanics very easy to implement and put into engineering practice. Mm -hmm. The other thing you mentioned was equipment I uh, worked with a company by the name of, uh, with GCTS out of Tempe, Arizona. And with, uh, in collaboration with them, um, we put together a pressure plate device that would, um, uh, was more geared towards the needs of geotechnical engineering because mm -hmm. previous pieces of equipment were geared towards agricultural yeah. applications. And so, uh, we had a, there were different requirements for geotechnical engineering. And so that, that was one of the pre, uh, special pressure plate device is being marketed by GCTS and it's sold around the world. Another device I worked on a lot was uh, a gauge to measure soil suction. Um, I came up with the thermal conductivity suction sensor it was appeared to be superior to anything else that had been built to date, but there was a problem. The problem was that it cost too much. And uh, if you have two sensors on the market, one costs less than the other, it's um, the temptation is always to uh, use the, the cheapest or the, le the, the device that costs the least. Yeah. And so it, it was, 
we could say a failure, even though it was somewhat of a success. Good stuff here. So this is changing gears a little bit, but what unusual experiences have you experienced in your career? Unusual experiences. Well, as part of my career, I have done a lot of traveling. I think anyone who has done a lot of traveling has a lot of experiences they could record and could talk about. I, uh, I think back, I think of sp spending Christmas in 1975 in Tehran, Iran because our 747 Boeing could not get off the ground. It had been, one of the engines had been sabotaged at a previous stop. And so for two and a half days, I lived with about 400 and some other passengers on a 747. And I came to the realization that the bathrooms in a 747 are not, may, do not have the capacity required for two and a half days sitting on an airplane. Uh, that airplane never did take any passengers. We eventually had to get another airplane. So that, I, I could go on and tell many, many stories about. So that was uh, a key uh, research finding of that part of the time in your life then, hey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I hold up this um, biography uh, that, really tells a lot of the uh, things that happened and the incidents that uh, occurred. And so I won't say anything more about that except uh, I had experiences working for the consulting firm where they never really put the safety of people as very important. And so I went out on projects like flying into Tuktoaktuk on the Arctic Ocean and the temperature going down to minus 30 degrees overnight and the, the pontoon plane that we flew in on the day before was frozen into the ice. And uh, eventually I got out of there. But probably the most, uh, the, the, the scariest or the most terrible thing that ever happened to me was to be lost with a, a geotechn another geotechnical engineer, but getting lost in the foothills of the Rockies. Mm. And we had a bombardier that broke down and we couldn't get out. And so we were stuck uh, uh, in the Rockies and the temperature, a storm blew in and the temperatures went down to minus 25 degrees Celsius. At 20, minus 25 Fahrenheit and Celsius feel about the same. But eventually, my partner had, he had three matches and we managed on the third match, just like a Hollywood movie, yeah. uh, to get the little fire going. And if we would have not had that fire going, I would not be here today. I remember the point at which my partner w w lay down in the snow and he, he said that he couldn't go any further and he, he gave up. And at that point, I realized that we were in real trouble. Mm -hmm. I was found the next, uh, both of us were found the next morning uh, uh, at 6 a.m. by one person who dared to uh, search for us. Mm -hmm. And anyways, it's a story that's in the book. You can read it, find it there on Amazon and read it. Quite the story. And what, what year approximately was that? When that was happened. 1966. 66. Yes. Yeah. And I, I came home, uh, told my wife that, that um, I think we have to change jobs because I don't think they value the safety of their employees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. What influences us here? So who are the next question? Who are the top people that have, an, have had an impact on your career? Well, the first one I mention is somebody that many people do not know. It's a professor by the name of Cal Noble. Cal Noble um, was my first professor at the University of Saskatchewan in, in teaching me um, uh, soil mechanics. Uh, he, he said to me at one point, he said, I don't think I've had a student that is as interested in soil mechanics as you ever. Then he turned around and said, you should go for a master's degree next year. 
and I'll get a scholarship for, uh, for you to go to the University of Alberta, uh, which he did, and they, he said they will pay you this, such and such an amount. I thought, this is great if I can get paid to go to university and study a subject that had intrigued me and, and I uh, wanted to continue on in that. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first person. Next person I uh, was at the University of Alberta was Bob Hardy. Bob Hardy had studied under Terzaghi in Harvard and he came back to Canada and he was the father of soil mechanics for Canada. Yep. And so it was a real privilege to go and study under him. I, what I remember about Bob Hardy is he could start off on uh, teaching on consolidation or shear strength, almost any subject, and he would end up talking about a case history that he was working and consulting on, and he would say, now I'll tell you about the real world of soil mechanics. And I, remember, I heard that statement every few lectures, I'll tell you about the real world of soil mechanics. So that's Bob Hardy. He had. Uh, it was a real privilege to study under him. When I went back for my PhD, I studied under Norbert Morgenstern, and uh, he asked me what I hoped to achieve uh, on my PhD program. And I said, well, I, I feel I'm a little bit weak in mathematics. I'd like to study math. And he said, no, it's not mathematics, that the more mathematics you need. He says, I will want to introduce you to the field of continuum mechanics. Mm. He says, you will get enough mathematics uh, if you take my classes and if you study continuum mechanics. And so that introduced me to the, the powerful area of continuum mechanics and went on to help me... Um, put together some of the basic building blocks for unsaturated soil mechanics. Yeah. Now that's more Gernstein. I would mention also Bent Brahms, the past president of the ISS MGE. He, he was um, headed up the geotechnical program in Singapore where I was. Mm -hmm. And he talked to me about uh, asking me where I would like to go around Southeast Asia um, while I was in Singapore for a year. And he suggested I go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he told me um, about some of the other countries, and I said, no, Vietnam is where I want to go. He managed to get a visa for me to get in at a time when it was very difficult to get into Vietnam. I went to Vietnam, and it, it, it changed the direction of my career somewhat and that I, I realize that it's very important to have a part of your mandate or part of your career dedicated to char charity because people in developing countries need unsaturated soil mechanics and saturated soil mechanics just as much as the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the many graduate students that I've had. With, I, Professors uh, learn from their graduate students, and one in particular was Harianto Raharjo from Indonesia. He um, did his master's and PhD under me, and then came to me and said, I'd like to help you write a book on unsaturated soil mechanics. And so we wrote two textbooks on, on uh, unsaturated soil mechanics, and uh, I I have to give a lot of credit to Harry Unto, who spent almost 10 years of his time when he could be doing professional development personally, but just helping me put together two textbooks. Excellent. Yeah, and I remember you, you having a lot of grad students, was my perspective, from almost every corner of the earth, and they were always very gracious. They would have us over for meals, and I remember as a kid just enjoying all the different cultural meals that we got growing up. It gave me a very... Mm -hmm kind of um, wide view of the world that was, uh, you know, when I look back on it now, it's valued. So yes. it's very interesting. Um, which leads into the next question. How would you describe your philosophy of life? By philosophy of life, I presume you mean philosophy of life and not philosophy of soil mechanics, although there might be an overlap <laughs> between the two. Um, 
I would say that as, um, as I have aged, I have, my philosophy has changed a bit. And I think it was changed and influenced very much by the time that I spent in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, I went there f first time in 1993. 1995, I went back the second time. This time, I had received funding to have the technology exchange program. And I remember they gave me a testimonial dinner with the government officials from Vietnam in 1995, and I was uh, sitting at this, uh, the banquet table by the wife of one of the ministers in the government. Yeah. And um, she asked me a question that I had ponder, been thinking about. She said, um, why did you come to Vietnam? And why did you come back to Vietnam? Why would you come back to Vietnam? And I, as I, I had already thought of this question. It had been on my mind, and so I was, I had an answer that I had prepared, and it went like this. And is sort of my philosophy of life. If I live my life for myself, I will simply feed my ego, and when life is over, I will have nothing to show. Mm -hmm. If I live my life with others in mind. I will feed my soul, and life will have more meaning. And uh, I went back to Vietnam probably 25, 30 times. I had an exchange program, and I realized the importance of having a part of my life dedicated to charity. Mm -hmm. And it's very become very meaningful to me. And uh, I think it is a significant part of my philosophy of life. Yeah. And I was fortunate to go over to Vietnam on one of those trips with a bunch of other grad students. And <laughs> that was a, a memorable trip, as I remember it. So. so, Dad, have you, the next question is kind of interesting. Have you made any mistakes in your career? That, that is an obvious question, answer to that question of my. If I had not made mistakes, I would not, uh, I could not admit it in front of you, uh, it's for sure. <laughs> but um, it, I don't think it's whether you've made mistakes, it's whether you've allowed the mistakes to define you. Mm -hmm. uh, I do find that researchers in geotechnical engineering have a large ego, and as such it is hard to admit if you ever do make a mistake. And this is, I think, somewhat true of researchers come to conferences and they get to be known by their previous discoveries. And so um, they have, find it very hard to change um, their point of view. Yeah. It's, and still, the scientific methodology should drive us to always getting closer and closer to the true understanding of a certain response. All right, Dad, can you tell us a little bit about your family? Well, I've been married to Joanne for coming up to 60 years. So I have to give her credit for a lot of patience, and she's spent a lot of time looking after her four children while I was spending a lot of time in airplanes. But uh, I have uh, three boys and a girl. I, um, I never in influenced them as to what they should go into, but they, um, I just uh, encouraged them as long as they had um, a desire to learn and go to university, I would try to cover their expenses as long as they went to university. I'm reminded of a, a book that I picked up in the airport called Die Broke. And I read that book and I found it to be very insightful. It said there are certain times in the life of your children when you should invest. And usually it's after they come out of high school if you invest in your children at that time. 
So I said to my children, I bought them a copy of the book and said, read it. And then I said, I will try to pay for your education. Mm -hmm. And um, Murray went to university for eight years. I have another son who studied engineering, another son who is an optometrist, and a daughter who is um, an, a veterinarian. I think they all went to university for eight years, and I consider it to be a, a wise investment. Mm -hmm. I, so they don't, I, I, they're not depending on me in their old age, they're, I'm depending on them. <laughs> <laughs> and my recollection is growing up with all our activities, we did our best to help you die broke, right? Like yes. we, there was, we helped where we could, really. Yes. <laughs> So, next question, what have we done as a family? Well... Or what have you done as a family, I guess? Well, I mentioned that uh, we, tra we traveled and, uh, and have taken them to many places and done many things together. But I think uh, I have, um, uh, uh, having grown up on a farm and spending so much time in the woods, I, I loved nature, I loved animals and birds. I used to enjoy taking the, the kids on hikes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the three boys were very much involved in hockey, ice hockey and sports. And uh, the girl was also involved in uh, horseback riding. Yeah. And so uh, we, we did uh, traveling together, we did try to uh, do things as a family yeah. while they're growing up. Good stuff. And I remember a lot of those activities there. It's fond memories here. So what recent trips have you made? Well, there isn't too much recent trips. Just about a month before COVID hit, I, Joanne and I traveled to South uh, Africa, Cape Town, to... Uh, speak at a conference there, came home and then had another conference in Vietnam. And I said to Joanne that this is getting to be too hard for me to travel around the globe. Um, at, uh, I could see my age was catching up to me, but COVID caught up sooner. And I, I really quit traveling and had to try to switch over and use Zoom, which wasn't very satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't done much traveling since, and I, I haven't really missed it. I've enjoyed r writing my memoirs and, um, and enjoyed uh, still writing uh, technical research papers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and another question, what do you anticipate is in your future? Well, I anticipate simply Growing old graciously. <laughs> I, I, I've had it hard, I must admit, I've had it hard to retire. And I enjoy uh, still doing mentoring, some, some young faculty, and I enjoy the contact with the area of unsaturated soils and trying to keep up with it and uh, just trying to keep up with what's um, uh, happening in computer software development and what's uh, happening in the theory of unsaturated soil mechanics. Yeah, and you always enjoyed the technical aspect and the engagement and seeing what was done and what's happening on the cutting edge. So it continues to be an interest yeah. of yours, right? Yes, and it's hard to completely stop thinking about something like uh, on a certain subject like unsaturated soil mechanics and say I'm going to now take up golfing. Uh, <laughs> it just doesn't um, cut it for me. Yeah, so your golfing game is not doing well is what you're telling no. us. And I, if I do golf, I'm embarrassed by my son. So. <laughs> there you go. Not intentionally. But any, any special thanks to mention? Oh, I have lots of uh, people I should thank. I, I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for um, 
the four children who have showed a lot of patience with me. I am, I am thankful for the spouses that they married. And uh, I'm also thankful to my grandparents, my parents, who um, right from an early age um, taught me from the Bible, taught me about a God who was not only creator, but also the designer. Mm -hmm. They taught me a way of life that was satisfying, that recognized that there had to be a God behind all of this. And to get to know him through reading the Bible, it was very important. Yeah, rich heritage, hey? Yes. Yeah, for sure. So the next question is interesting here. What is the best advice you've ever received? The best advice I've received, I think, goes back to when I was doing my master's degree and finishing up in the head of the department at the University of Alberta, spoke to the graduate students and gave them some advice. And I was very surprised at one of the statements he made, but he said, be careful, you do not sell your soul to the company. And that could be to a university. Be careful, you do not sell your soul to your place of employment because you will find out that companies and universities do not have a soul. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it, uh, it's very important that you have to have more than just your career. And if you give everything to that, your family grows up very fast. And if you're not careful, you'll miss the whole experience of them growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have, I have uh, he, he also said something else. He said, you, you will make enough mistakes in your first two years on, of employment. So you owe it to yourself to change jobs. <laughs> And I, I wouldn't have thought that. I would have thought that I gave everything to um, my place of employment, but I found I had to be careful. I had to cut back because it's very easy to give your whole life to your profession. And I have found that, that it is very important to have a charitable component to life. And it seems like over and over again, I have been brought back to that, the importance of living for, with others in mind, because there's many needs in the world today. Yeah, excellent thoughts here. And next question, how important was independent consulting on projects to your success as a teacher and a researcher? How did it influence your teaching and your research? Well, uh, consulting is um, it's got a good aspect to it and, and a questionable aspect. As head of the department, I like to see um, the professors giving um, uh, attention to consulting, but it is very easy for it to get to be too much. However, consulting that is focused on your area that you're researching is yeah. very valuable. You get case histories. You add a lot of interest uh, to the class room yeah. uh, by the stories you can tell. So again, um, as long as they don't sell their soul to money mm -hmm. uh, or the rewards of consulting, the consulting can be very valuable. I have a, a couple of projects that I think of uh, were very important to me. I was asked to consult on the slope stability problems in Hong Kong. Yeah. And it, it turned out to be, I would say, far more successful than I had ever anticipated it would be. And it cer certainly added to the theory that I studied to find that, that you, these things really do work in engineering practice. And so yeah. I like to go from um, engineering theory and then see that it works in practice. 
Another case history that I was involved in was the collapse of Highland Towers. That was 72 people buried in that one. The, the Hong Kong Poshan landslide was 78. Mm -hmm. And so these are very important slope stability problems. Yeah. And the Highland Towers, it turned out to be a, a problem that also involved unsaturated soils. I after I retired, took early retirement from the University of Saskatchewan, I went, uh, after a couple of years, went with uh, Golder Associates, and I formed the Golder Unsaturated Soils Group. And it gave me a window into the importance <clears throat> of weather as a boundary condition. Yeah. Moisture is either going up or coming down from the ground surface at all times. It has to have an influence on how our engineered structures perform. And so I, the whole purpose of the Golder Unsaturated uh, Soils Group was for first to make money, but also to see whether you can figure out how to take the theory and uh, what the, the road ahead is for app applying it. Yeah. So I think that's my response. Yeah, and there's something unique about um, those types of projects that force you to align with reality and, it, and apply the theory. It's, yeah. I find as I go on to my own career, it's, it's valuable, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So next question, you've received prestigious awards like the Leggett Award, 1999, the Order of Canada, 2004, the Trezaghi Award, 2005. Which is the most meaningful and why? Oh my. Well, I, I certainly don't do research just because I, I want an award. But I, without question, I think the one that was most meaningful to me is the Order of Canada. And part of the reason why it was most meaningful was that it is not only given for having been successful in a certain area of your specialization. Mm -hmm. It's not only given for that. You can be very good in that and still you won't receive the Order of Canada. The Order of Canada has to um, involve doing something outside your area of specialty. Yeah. Caring about uh, somebody else that has needs in the world. In other words, it's saying you must have a charitable component to your life. And to get a, an award for that, uh, granted by the Queen through the Governor General of Canada, is very meaningful. Mm -hmm. Let's see, that's the next war award, I would say, is a Tersagi Award, given by the uh, ASC in the United States. I, I c can't help but think back to when I first started um, on my graduate program at University of Alberta, Bob Hardy said, there are three books. I want you to go out and buy textbooks. And one of them was Theoretical Soil Mechanics by Carl Zerzaghi. Mm -hmm. I absorbed that book, I read it, I underlined it, and I realized that this man had such great insight into how to put together a science for saturated soil mechanics. And yeah. much of that can be copied over and used in unsaturated. So I, uh, to near the end of my career, to turn around and get um, a Terzaghi Award, it was very meaningful because I'd held his, his textbook in such high esteem. And then the next award is the Leggett mm -hmm. Award, which is the highest uh, award given in Canada by the Canadian Geotechnical uh, society. And it, it is rewarding to be recognized by your colleagues. And you, you don't work and live for awards, but when they come, uh, it, it is satisfying. Yeah. Uh, I also should mention my graduate students. Um, that uh, do the research work and I put it together and I get credit for it very often. I, um, I shouldn't have credit for everything. It's, uh, many others are involved. And I mentioned especially 
um, been able to work with uh, Harry Anto Raharjo yeah. and putting together two books. And also a very uh, great honor to have been able to work with you on the, um, the book uh, um, uh, From Theory to Practice of Unsaturated yeah. Soul Mechanics. Yeah. Murray had a lot of contribution in terms of the computer modeling of all aspects, whether it's seepage or slope stability. Yeah. And, um, and then um, I have, he mentioned 100 graduate students or more. I, I am grateful for, uh, to them for all their contributions. Yeah, excellent. Not, not, just, not just medals and awards. Yeah. Well, I know the projects we've worked on have been fun to, uh, challenging and uh, fun to work on together, right? Yeah. So, of your numerous contributions to the engineering profession, which would you consider the most impactful? Uh, I think the most significant contribution comes out of <clears throat> being introduced to continuum mechanics. And I would say that out of that came the the, the fundamental building blocks for unsaturated soil mechanics. The, the stress state variables. And I find that uh, people, uh, engineers still seem to have it hard to uh, embrace it, but it is the most significant contribution. And it came about, I'll use one theoretical statement here. It came about through understanding the superposition of equilibrium stress fields for a multi-phase system. In other words, continuum mechanics teaches us that there are a stress field associated with every face of an unsaturated soil. And if you look at equilibrium of that, uh, those stress fields out of that will come the basic building blocks, your total stress tensor and uh, your suction sensor. So what the world is needing is the basic building blocks. And still it seems that they have so often wanted to find an equation that would do the same thing as, and uh, I am, um, so it's been hard to convince them, the world, that basic building blocks of unsaturated soil mechanics uh, come out of continuum mechanics. And uh, there's other, uh, another th other things are hard to convince. And that is that we can, in the G G unsaturated soil mechanics, we can, we, we can use estimation procedures. Yeah. We, we can use the soil water characteristic curve. Mm -hmm. and get the properties we need for the input to solve saturated and unsaturated soils as a conti one continuum. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, the longer I am associated with that, the more convinced I am that it is the, uh, the right way to understand unsaturated soil mechanics. But it is not easy to convince the world, yeah. and it's a challenge. So I often get asked at conferences, I, you know, I, somebody came up to me at a conference a while ago and said, I really love that paper you published back. And I, I realized they were talking about a paper in 1972 that I was like four years old. And a lot of people don't realize that where there's a father-son combo here. Mm -hmm. And they're surprised then to learn that the son went into geotech and engineering. And they asked me, is the next question, did my father influence that decision a lot? So maybe you can speak to that a little bit. <laughs> Well, I, um, I never encouraged Murray to go into geotechnical engineering. I, uh, if anything, I would have um, discouraged him because it's always hard for a son to follow the father, whether the father has a good or bad reputation, it's always hard to follow. But I can remember when I was, when Murray was, um, uh, finishing his grade 12 in high school and then he wanted a ride into university one day to uh, get an application for applying to go to college or university next year. I said, what 
area are you going into? He says, engineering, just as if, did I have a choice? And I says, um, uh, yes, you can do anything you want, but he says, no, I want to do what you want to do. And I, I have not uh, encouraged him, I've not discouraged him, and I wasn't really af afraid of that he would do much better than I did. Anyways, um, I, uh, I'm glad that he has taken over and, and done some very interesting things, especially in computer applications in geotechnical, unsat saturated, unsaturated soil systems. Yeah. Fortunately, I found out when I got into the career that you hadn't done everything and there was still something left for me to do, <laughs> yeah. right? So I figured that out. So. Yeah. Um, next question, your Geolegend interview article tells a bit about the musical instruments and talents of the Fredland family. So what more can you tell us here? Well, music was an important part of my background and my family, and it was very much a part of Joanne's background. Joanne is the real musician. I'm the hobby musician. I play saxophone, mandolin. But uh, <clears throat> Joanne started playing in church when she was 12 years old, and she went on to get two degrees in, in, in music. So she's really the real musician. Uh, and we, we have recorded um, a, a number of, uh, well, we started with long play records and, and then tapes and then uh, uh, CDs. And I, I think I'll like to give you one, I'll send you one MP4 file that will uh, have one of our songs, and it's the song Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. I, I pick it because it is a very meaningful song. Mm -hmm. Give thanks with a grateful heart. I think that it is so important in life to give thanks every day for all that we have. And all we ask in the end is, a, is, is gratitude, and that gives um, satisfaction to all your endeavors. So what, what would you say is the most misunderstood aspect of unsaturated soil mechanics? Most in, misunderstood is the, um, the role that the independent stress state variables plays. And there's emphasis on independent stress state variables. Mm -hmm. And the, it seems that even though it has such a sound basis in continuum mechanics, still it's hard to change the whole engineering profession. Mm -hmm. And it, it, uh, it, it takes maybe more than one generation of people. But um, I'm thankful for the contribution I have been able to make. Yeah, can you clarify the most important lesson you've learned and how that epiphany came about? I think the important lesson it is it's, it's very, very hard to change the thinking of research scientists. If they start down one road, it builds, it builds an ego associated with their area of specialization and it's very hard for them to say, I was wrong, mm -hmm. and to change. So we build uh, error into our discoveries because we, it's so hard to say, I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, marriage does, does a lot for uh, men to solve this problem because <laughs> you learn that it's very important to learn this little phrase, I was wrong. And uh, it's, it, it's uh, important not only in the family, it's important in um, our professions as well. <laughs> Good stuff. I, I can relate to that at some certain level here. <laughs> You've co-authored two well-respected textbooks on unsaturated soil mechanics. So what challenges did you encounter during the collabor collaboration effort? And did you have any disagreements? Well, that's easy to answer. There, 
did we have any disagreements? The answer is no. I can never... I, I had excellent uh, people to work with. I worked with Harry Ento for 10 years. And I realized he had some talents in mathematics and accuracy in, of math that I didn't have. And so he, he was very... Uh, I needed him. And then in the second book, I needed to uh, have uh, more uh, information in the book on uh, solving highly nonlinear partial differential equations. And this is what uh, excites my son Murray, who knows a lot more about computers than I ever will know. And so uh, there was never, never a need for uh, dispute or we realized we each had strengths and we had weaknesses and we worked together. So there was never a dispute. Excellent. Well, that's the end of the questions here today. I just want to end this by thanking you for your time and your insight into your life. And it's been my privilege to interview you uh, today. So thank you again for your time. And thank you for taking the time to interview me.